It is now my distinct privilege to introduce to you our final speaker of the day. Thomas R. Lee serves as Associate Chief Justice of the Utah Supreme Court. He graduated with high honors from the University of Chicago Law School and is a former law clerk to Justice Clarence Thomas and to Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson III. Before his appointment to the Utah Supreme Court, Tom was a full-time law professor at Brigham Young University. In his spare time, he teaches as a lecturer at Brigham Young University, Harvard University, and the University of Chicago. He has written extensively at the intersection of law and linguistics. His ju judicial opinions and academic scholarship advocate the use of theories and tools used by linguists in interpreting the language of the law. His judicial and academic work on law and language has been cited in a range of federal and state courts. During his years as a, as a full-time law professor, Tom developed a part-time appellate practice, arguing cases in federal courts throughout the country and even in the United States Supreme Court. In 2004 and 2005, he served as Deputy, Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. It is a rare honor to be able to learn from him in real time. Tom, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Scott. It's an honor to be included, and I feel sad I, didn't, I wasn't able to uh, participate in all this morning's um, conference. What, what a great uh, conference this is. Um, I, I specifically feel bad that I missed uh, uh, Jesse Egbert's presentation. I've learned so much from Jesse. Uh, loved hearing at least the second, the latter part of what uh, Tammy Gales presented. I, I agree with Tammy, everyone needs a linguist. Some of the most interesting people I've met in the last few years have been linguists and learned so much from them. So I want to I want to give a little bit of a perspective, um, the history of the use of corpus linguistic tools on the court that I'm serving on, on the Utah Supreme Court. i tell you about three uh, specific cases in which I have proposed to use different tools that linguists use, uh, corpus linguists might use, to resolve problems of interpretation, either under a Utah statute or the Utah Constitution. Um, and I think it may give us both um, a, a little bit of just interesting history, a little bit of background, as well as um, some perspective on what I think is a building and developing field of, of law linguistics and why I think this conference is so important. I think the place to start is for me to say something about why um, judges and lawyers take language seriously um, in the interpretive task of trying to resolve ambiguities or indeterminacy in the language of the law. There is a, uh, has been a, a growing movement in the direction of textualism. And the idea of textualism is uh, that, that in discerning the meaning of the law, we are supposed to seek for the meaning of the, of the text that was enacted into law, rather than to try to find some abstract sense of its legislative purpose. This is um, a, an approach to interpretation championed by Justice Scalia and Judge Easterbrook and others. And part of the idea behind it is the argument that if what we try to do is instead of to interpret the language enacted into law, but to instead to try to discern what the legislative body meant or intended, we may end up just giving voice to our own preferences, to our own policy preferences, or in other words, legislating from the bench. And everybody agrees, not just conservatives, that that's a problem, that we ought to be giving, uh, minimizing this risk that as judges, we are uh, simply legislating from the bench and giving voice to our own policy preferences. Th there are lots of good reasons for trying to discern the what you can think of as the ordinary meaning or communicative content of the language of law. Um, some of them go to this idea that, that um, ordinary meaning matches up with our understanding of the rule of law, that if in discerning the meaning of language, we have a better chance of, of uh, applying objective criteria and uh, being transparent and predictable in the way that we are interpreting the language of the law. I think that's what this project about law and corpus linguistics or using corpus linguistic tools to interpret the language of the law, I think that's what it's about. Um, I have suggested previously that I think we've been 
under delivering on the promises of textualism. The premises of textualism are captured in this slide and the idea that uh, discerning the meaning of language is supposed to be objective, uh, predictable and determinate. Uh, but but sometimes that won't be possible, and sometimes uh, there may be less determinacy uh, than meets the eye if what we're doing is using traditional tools of interpretation. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second, and sort of as as I outline uh, some the, the history of corpus tools in the Utah Supreme Court. I'll, I'll talk about three specific cases and compare and contrast traditional tools that have been used in the past with the idea of supplementing those tools with the tools that corpus linguists might use. So this, this is a long-standing idea. Justice Holmes um, in the early part of the 20th century talked about trying to interpret the meaning of the language of law by, by thinking about what the words mean in the mouth of a normal speaker of English in, circumstance, in the circumstances in which they were used. Another judicial luminary of the 20th century, Justice Frankfurter noted that in, in the difficult problems of interpretation that arise, there's often a fair contest between two readings. The idea that in fact, the cases that get litigated and that come up to courts, especially appellate courts like mine, um, usually there, there's a, a, a contest that is, um, between probabilities of meaning. Uh, no easy answer in terms of the problem of ambiguity. So, so here, let me introduce you to the three um, illustrative cases that I wanna talk to you about in terms of the history of the use of these tools on our court. Um, I'll give you just a brief overview of each of them. And then I wanna dive into how our court has reacted to propose the proposals to use corpus tools um, in our courts. State versus Canton is a criminal case arising under uh, a tolling provision for statutes of limitations. So the, the statute at issue here, there, there's sort of two statutes interacting with each other. One that says you must bring certain criminal charges within a certain period of time. Another set that, that says, but that period of time tolls, or in other words, pauses for periods of time uh, within which a defendant is out of the state. The question in the Canton case uh, what was, what is the meaning of that phrase out of the state? There were two competing interpretations. One of them was, well, out of the state means physically beyond the borders of the state of Utah. The other was out of the state means um, outside of the jurisdictional reach, the legal, um, you might think of it as long arm jurisdiction for those of you who are uh, uh, trained in the law, that that's sort of the concept here beyond the state in terms of not physical boundaries, but instead it's, it's sort of legal reach. Uh, uh, Canton had been out of the state physically, uh, but had been within uh, the jurisdiction of the state in a way that I won't have time to talk about here. And so th that's where that uh, came about. The Rassabout case is another criminal case it's a drive-by shooting case, and it's a unit of prosecution case. The unit of prosecution case essentially is how many counts can you be charged with? So Andy Rassabout in a drive-by shooting discharged a weapon within um, uh, a certain number of feet of a dwelling in violation of this Utah statute that says that this is a, a crime to discharge a weapon or a firearm close to a close to a dwelling. And the question was, did he commit uh, a single act, a single um, unit of discharge of a firearm or multiple? And the question here as with out of the state is a problem of ambiguity. What does it mean to discharge? Mr. Rassabout's argument was discharge means empty. And he only emptied the bullets in the magazine and his gun once. And so that was a single discharge and the state's view was no discharge means shoot. And so he committed multiple counts of a violation under that statute. The last case that I wanna to talk to you about raises uh, questions under the Utah constitution. Uh, the Utah constitution says that uh, members of the board of education uh, well, let me take a step back from, well, let me restate that sentence. The state constitution says that you may use no partisan contest for persons who have employment in 
uh, the state education system. Uh, and the question in that case is, what does it mean to have employment in? Uh, the Board of Education had been subject to a partisan election by the legislature. And the argument was um, they are, uh, that's a violation of the state constitution because they have employment in the state education system. Again, two plausible arguments under the language. Um, one of the arguments was employment simply means to be employed is to be put into service in some way and that they provide a service and support the state education system by making policy. The contrary argument was no, to be employed in as a person is to have a legal relationship in terms of uh, a legal um, employment relationship as, as between an employer uh, and an employee. So in each one of these cases, uh, you know, we can, we can go back to the uh, Frankfurter notion, a fair contest between two readings. If we're just looking at dictionary definitions, we can find plausible arguments on each side. And so we as judges need to decide how to resolve those problems of interpretation. And can we do so in a transparent, objective way that doesn't leave room for us to, to give voice to our intuition? Traditionally, the way judges have uh, for a long time resolved these kinds of problems uh, of interpretation is to start with the dictionary, to use our intuition as speakers of the language. How do we understand um, the phrase or the word at issue uh, to be used? Perhaps uh, occasionally, at least, to look at the etymology of a word and to uh, tell us uh, to, to try to discern some meaning from uh, its sources or origins in another language, uh, its morphology, perhaps, um, looking at uh, two morphemes or pieces of a word, as in the discharge case, to look at the meaning of dis and the meaning of the term charge and to piece them together and uh, say that that may help us uh, understand the language. Linguistic canons, I won't say too much more about that, but you heard from Jesse Egbert earlier talking about some of the linguistic canons um, that judges have used. The three cases I'm talking about today, uh, canons didn't play too much of a role. So in these three cases, I uh, proposed either in majority opinions or in, in separate opinions, proposed that corpus linguistic analysis could help us answer the question presented. And the, the history of our court's um, experience in these three cases uh, I think is is interesting and, and gives us some background. I think maybe also tells us something about the possible future for the use of these tools um, in the courts. And before I dive into any of the detail and telling you the history here, I'll just give you sort of the, the end before we, we, we get into the detail, uh, tell you how the story ends. The, the court in the Canton case, as I'll show you, went along with an opinion that did a Google news search and said, here's a way to understand the meaning of out of the state. We can do a Google News search and get some evidence of the way that that phrase is used um, in, in uh, Google News search. And the, that's a majority opinion in Canton, and it's a unanimous majority opinion that I authored. The Rassabout case, that's the discharge of firearm case. You'll see, I'll give you the detail here in a second. That one turns out very differently. I proposed to do, actually, I, I did a Google News search in, in RAS about as well. But in addition to that, um, proposed to use the corpus of contemporary American English uh, to, to provide some additional evidence of uh, discharge of a firearm. And the majority uh, raised some objections, which I, I think were, uh, perfectly appropriate objections, which I'll mention in a minute, um, but, but ultimately uh, came down pretty hard against the utility of corpus linguistic tools. Uh, in the Richards case, the court came full circle. Uh, there, there had been some personal, personnel changes on our court, but also I think just some uh, other evolution and development going on in terms of the, the academy in the um, meaning the, the law review literature, as well as judicial opinions in, in other courts, I think had started to come around on the idea of the utility of these tools. And, and so in the Richards case, the majority opinion, in fact, this is a majority opinion authored by, by a colleague of mine, Justice Simonis, uh, openly endorsing the use of a COCA and a corpus, 
corpus of historical American English as well, since the Richards case involved a, a constitutional interpretation question in a provision that was um, a historical provision. So briefly in terms of some of the detail, in the Canton case, uh, the, the opinion for the court that I authored starts with the idea that part of the shortcomings associated with looking to dictionaries is that you can't look up a full phrase like out of the state. We can look up state, we can look up out. In fact, out of appears in a lot of dictionaries. So some phrases appear, but the full phrase out of the state, you can't look it up in a dictionary. And because we understand that sometimes phrases take on meaning other than just the sum of, of, of their parts, uh, we really need more evidence and more information than you can get um, out of a dictionary. And in the Canton opinion, I, I raised that point and then I said, look, the way to understand this is to look to the way that that phrase is ordinarily used. And what you'll find if you look for that is that the phrase out of the state, when it refers to an individual in reference to a, um, a, a state, always is used, according to the evidence that we were able to find in a Google News search, always is used by reference to someone being beyond the physical boundaries of a state, not in the way that Mr. Canton had proposed to use it. So this is the uh, a quote from a footnote in the opinion, noting the results of a Google News search and suggesting that of the relevant uh, references that we found, all of them cut against Mr. Canton and in favor of uh, the prosecution of the state in that case. Okay, so fast forward to the Rasabout case a couple of years later. Um, the, this is the discharge case. And here I wrote a separate opinion, a concurring opinion, agreeing with the majority's uh, ultimate holding, but uh, raising concerns associated with the way that the majority got there. The majority at least hints at the idea that the ordinary meaning of discharge is to, is to shoot, um, on, rooting that idea in what, what um, has become referred to as the sense ranking problem or the sense ranking fallacy, which is that if you look in a rank ordering list of dictionary definitions, the one that is listed more highly um, in the list is, uh, is to shoot rather than to empty uh, cargo or contents. That's a problem because dictionaries, uh, most all of them that we uh, look at don't rank their senses in order of frequency or ordinariness. So that raises that problem. Majority also references the idea of morphology, the idea that we can get the meaning of the term discharge by piecing together the prefix dis uh, with, with the root word charge. And it means that that must mean that the phrase means to, un means to undo a charge. And the, the point that I made in response to that is, yeah, that may be somewhat helpful, but it isn't always the way that our language use, uh, uh, uses uh, uh, prefixes um, or, or morphemes in our language. If, if it always worked that way, then it would be um, a, a disease would be a state of unease and Michael Scott would be uh, per perfectly using the, the English language perfectly appropriately and saying that all of our workers are, are fully gruntled, um, not always the way that we speak. Judicial intuition absolutely is an appropriate way to interpret the language of law. But my point there is uh, going back to, to what I started with in terms of trying to find objective, transparent grounds for interpreting language. If what we're saying in our intuition is, look, I know it when I hear it, when someone says discharge a firearm, it means to shoot, it doesn't mean to empty, uh, we ought to check our intuition. And so that's what I proposed to do and did in a separate opinion. I, I presented a Google News search as well as a COCA search. And uh, both of those showed that almost always when we speak of discharging a firearm, the context of the relevant concordance lines or sentences from those two sources show us that um, uh, the, the prosecution's version of discharge and, and the majority's version, the majority's intuition um, was correct. Okay. L lastly, let's see, I think I wanted to, yeah, I left out a, 
a slide or two. The, the slide that I left out here that I'll just mention now, that this, uh, in response to that argument, there's some uh, pretty strident and I think uh, to some degree appropriate pushback and criticism from the majority. Um, tacking back to some degree to something Tammy Gale said a few minutes ago, which, which I agree with, uh, which is that the uh, most judges, including me, um, aren't trained in linguistics and uh, that, that it is problematic or at least concerning um, for judges to do corpus linguistics uh, what, uh, sua sponte is the Latin phrase that, that the courts use uh, on our own accord without input from uh, experts and that we'd be a whole lot better off to have expert evidence and expert testimony. My response to that was I wholeheartedly agree I think it is super important for judges to have um, expert, expert witness testimony and input from uh, experts as well as adversary briefing on these sorts of problems. Uh, but but that, that same problem uh, really doesn't solve the problem, that, that concern really doesn't solve the problem for us because regardless of whether we are doing corpus linguistic analysis or simply consulting our intuition, what we're really doing is engaging in sua sponte analysis, something that's not very um, transparent, something that's not particularly apparent to uh, the litigants or to the parties in our judicial decision. If what we're saying to them is, take my word for it, this is the way discharge is used, um, we, I think we are better off and we better fulfill uh, the, the promises of textualism, of trying to do something that is objective and predictable and transparent to show our math and to check our intuition through uh, transparent presentation of corpus analysis. Having said all of that, I also agreed with the majority that in future cases, uh, I was hopeful that we would get adversary briefing and expert testimony, uh, which we have increasingly in um, more and more of the cases that come before us. So let me just tell you sort of how the story ends in terms of Richards versus Cox. In Richards versus Cox, um, the majority in an opinion written by my colleague, Justice Himonis, cites some uh, law review literature that had uh, become, uh, that had been published in the aftermath of the Rassabout case essentially endorsing the utility of corpus linguistic analysis and suggesting that although adverse adversary briefing and expert testimony would be really useful, it's not essential. And, and raising this concern, citing the concurrence, my concurrence from the Rassabout case, raising this concern that yeah, our intuition may be helpful and is a good starting point, but our human intuition of ordinary meaning is fallible and that uh, we have a tool that's available to us that we can use when it's appropriate to give us evidence that will aid our inquiry into ordinary meaning beyond the assistance that we can get from dictionaries to check our intuition and give us additional useful information and, and specifically concluding, repudiating essentially the majority opinion from Rassabout, which says, no, we don't, this is not appropriate. This is not um, something that judges are equipped to do, saying, yeah, we can use corpus linguistics to check our intuition against publicly available means for assessing uh, with, with these publicly available means for testing the ordinary meaning of a statutory phrase. And so in Richards, the majority looks both at COHA and COCA. Here I've got COHA, which is the historical corpus, um, looking at a decade, the decade in which the constitutional provision uh, at issue had been adopted and saying, look, in all of the sentences and all the concordance lines that we have access to that speak of a person having employment in an organization, 94 of them refer to a legal employment relationship. None of them use this sort of broader notion of look to employ is simply to to, to use someone's services in, in some less formal way. And, and concluding on that basis that therefore um, the, the interpretation proffered by uh, Mr. Cox, who's our current governor and was then the Lieutenant governor, which was to 
uh, argue in favor of, of upholding the constitutionality of the, of the statute in question, endorsing that not on the basis of our intuition of what it means to have employment in or a dictionary definition of employ, which really doesn't get us there, but instead uh, presenting corpus linguistic analysis. I wanna just offer by, by way of conclusion and, and so that I can leave uh, plenty of time for any comments or questions that anyone might have, a little bit of kind of retrospective observation and background on how we got from Rassabout to Richards. Um, I think part of what's going on and part of this development is, is um, increasing awareness on the part of judges in other jurisdictions and, and or more generally of the possible utility of these tools. Here you can see a chart from uh, an article that just recently was published online on the University of Chicago Law Review, uh, kind of charting the use of corpus linguistics in the courts. And what, what you'll see is that what started as kind of a, a, a Utah phenomenon and some harebrained idea that some Utah Supreme Court justice had to um, increasing uses in other courts. This list on this slide is already outdated. There, there are already uh, the Vermont Supreme Court in the, in the month or so since this article was published online has uh, used corpus linguistics in one of its opinions. Um, as well as I, I, there's one at least one additional circuit. I think it might be the second circuit if I'm thinking about it um, right. And so part of this is we as judges are, are naturally um, conservative, not, not in a political sense, but in a sort of being um, careful and um, hesitant to do too many new things. And I think that's a, that, that, that kind of restraint and hesitancy and that, that sort of conservatism, I think, is perfectly appropriate. And, and again, I, I applaud the pushback that I got in the Rassabout case. Uh, and I, I, I think the dialogue about how useful these tools can be. And again, to refer back to what uh, Tammy Gales told us a few minutes ago, I also think it's super important for us to develop best practices and to make sure that the way corpus tools are used um, doesn't give rise to some of the same criticisms that I have uh, leveled toward the use of dictionaries or, or etymology or other uh, sorts of tools. Uh, I, th I think the other thing uh, by way of wrapping up that, I, that I've, I'd be remiss if I didn't say is, is just um, open-mindedness on the part of colleagues and a willingness to sort of think about problems and shortcomings with the way that we traditionally have approached problems of interpretation. And I, I, I think that it's gratifying to see where this has come and how far this has come. And a, a big part of uh, the, the, the debt of gratitude that I have is to colleagues who are willing to, um, to listen and to think about this problem. The, the second to last thing I wanna say before I wrap up and, and, and leave time for questions is, Part of what's going on here, I think also in terms of developments and increasing judicial openness to the use of corpus linguistic tools um, is that, that there are opinions in the US Supreme Court that have uh, alluded to or proposed the possible utility of corpus linguistic tools in interpretation. There are two separate opinions from Justice Thomas that are cited here that, that I won't uh, speak to in any great uh, detail. And then very recently, just a couple of weeks ago, an opinion, a separate opinion from Justice Alito, suggesting that uh, we may need to use the tools of corpus linguistics to evaluate our linguistic canons. Linguistic canons claim to be stating um, rules of thumb or general accepted practices that help us to disambiguate um, our language. And uh, if that's what they're about, to the extent that's what they're about, we as judges and lawyers and those who care about the language of law ought to be um, using linguistic theory and tools to try to better conform those canons and, and refine those canons and make them uh, more transparent and more replicable uh, more objective in the way that they get applied. I'll end with this and, and then I'll, I'll uh, 
leave the rest of the time for comments or questions that you might have. Uh, this is a concluding paragraph from my concurring opinion in Rassabout. I'm, I'm not going to quote it as I stand here. You, you can see what I said there. I just want to close with this observation. It, it is such a significant thing that we as judges do to disambiguate language. I've, I've, I've observed before um, that we as judges are linguists. That, that I, I say that partly with tongue in cheek, but, but partly in, in, the, in a literal way in, in the following sense. We are linguists in the sense that, I've even said we're professional linguists. That, that really drives people nuts. And I don't at all mean to suggest that we have PhD training in linguistics. All I mean by that is that we as judges, are, our job, what we are paid to do is to resolve ambiguities in language. To the extent that's our job, um, it is incumbent on us to do it in, in a reliable way, in a way that does in fact credit the ordinary meaning, the communicative content of the language of the law, and um, to educate ourselves in uh, the, the, the kind of theory and the kind of tools that you all as linguists can help us to understand better, which is why I so applaud uh, Scott Jarvis and the University of Utah and th those who, who have put this, this forum together. I think it's crucial. I think it's really important, and I look forward to a future in which we learn more and more from each other. Thank you, Tom, for that very compelling talk. Very interesting. We have some questions that are now coming in. One from Aubrey Clark who asks, what challenges may arise when using these dictionaries against vernacular English that is not considered standard? It's a question about dialects basically. So how do we determine you know, the intended meaning um, when we're dealing with dialects that where maybe the corpus we're looking at represents the standard but not the dialect? Yeah, it, it, it's such an important question. Um, it has occasionally been leveled as a, as a criticism of the use of corpus linguistic tools on, on the ground that, and I think this is just building on the premise of the question, uh, on the ground that the tools that so far, the, the corpora that so far have been used are, are general um, kind of standard vernacular corpora. The, the, or the response that I have given to that, and, and I think it's an important one, is the response that, that, that says that there is nothing about corpus linguistic analysis that has to limit, it, limit us to those kinds of corpora. And that in fact, this concern points out a feature and not a bug in the use of corpus linguistic tools in, in, in the following sense. Um, we can, and many people have, begun to develop more specialized corpora. Let me, let me give you one really specific example, and then I'll, then I'll stop and, and, and take another question. Um, one of the arguments, one of the criticisms that's been made is that, well, sometimes the language of law is speaking in a very specific um, legal vernacular. And some language, sometimes the language of the law is, is phrased in terms of a legal term of art. And so instead of looking to something like the corpus of contemporary American English, we need to understand how the language of law is used uh, in that vernacular. And, and there's been some really interesting work that has been done in light of this point, and it's to develop, the, Jesse Egbert, for example, has developed a corpus of the United States Code. Uh, others have begun to develop uh, corpora uh, incorporating uh, legislative history from statutes. So you, you can do these same kinds of searches with more specialized corpora and even do some sort of comparative analysis looking at how is a phrase used in a, in a specialized language community versus a more general language community. The point being, these tools give us evidence that isn't otherwise available to us. And I, I think really open the horizon to broader and broader sorts of inquiries. Thank you. We have a couple more questions about corpus linguistics tools. One from Raymond Wixom that uh, says, as judicial use of corpus linguistics develops, how do you see judges sua sponte availing themselves of linguistic data and analysis? Does the court retain a linguist on staff or have a linguist on retainer? 
assuming the parties in a case have not presented corpus linguistics evidence, when a judge does so sua sponte, does the, does the judge invite the parties to respond to the judge's conclusions? Yeah, the, this is also a really important question. And um, we could probably talk about this for, for quite a while. Let me see if I can try to give a, a succinct answer to it. I, I think the first thing that I will say is that I agree with the pushback in the RAS about opinion that the very best way for judges to analyze these sorts of questions is to have adversary briefing where an appellant and an appellee, if it's, an, if it's a case on appeal, each have an expert linguist and each are presenting analysis to us um, in back and forth adversary briefing. That's the gold standard, that's the ideal. Um, I think a second order, maybe a second best approach, which is alluded to in this question, would be the possibility of uh, a, a judge um, asking for supplemental briefing. This has happened in a couple of cases, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in, in the federal system, a couple of years ago, issued a supplemental briefing order um, indicating its interest in knowing whether corpus linguistic analysis could help inform uh, the answer to the question. And I, I think that's a, that's a second best sort of solution. The last thing I would say here is, um, I think that even though it, it, that there are concerns associated with doing corpus linguistic analysis sua sponte, to me, it's better than making a guess based on tools that can't give us the evidence that we need to answer the question that is presented to us. Uh, and, and if the dictionary doesn't tell us what discharge a firearm, uh, how it is ordinarily used, or if the dictionary doesn't tell us uh, you know, what it means to be out of the state and we have available to us a resource that can help us analyze those sorts of questions, I think we should avail, our, avail ourselves of, of those resources to the point about should we have a linguist on staff? That might be ideal. Um, the, the future that I envision, though, is a future where there are classes on law and linguistics in law schools because the interpretation of the language of law so often requires lawyers and judges to have an understanding of the theory and tools of linguistics. We won't ever become the same kinds of experts that, uh, of course, that a PhD linguist would, but I think we, we can and need to get better educated. So that, that, those are some thoughts. Excellent question. Thank you. Ed Finnegan um, says, you've indicated that hard cases, often with ambiguous interpretations of a phrase, commonly find their way to appellate courts. But how does one justify quantifying and choosing the most frequent corpus hit when de facto the alternative interpretation is also valid, if not as frequent and could be the appropriate one in a particular case? Yeah, so, so I should have figured Ed would ask me the hardest <laughs> question of all, because this is, this is such a big question and, and such a difficult one. Um, it, uh, it is a question, I, I will say maybe two things in response to this question. One, I, I would point out, as, as I pointed out before, um, this problem is really a problem for legal interpretation for the theory of interpretation rather than really for uh, corpus linguistics. So this is absolutely a concern and a problem and a question, but I think the, the problem doesn't go away if what, we, if what we decide is because corpus linguistics can't give us a perfect answer to this question, let's ignore it and let's go back to just using the dictionary or our intuitions or you know, simply um, etymology or morphology or something like that. So, so that, that's one point. I, I think the second point is, ha having said all that, I think at least in some circumstances, when we refine the legal interpretive theory, there are going to be good reasons to give credit to the more frequent iteration of a given sense. I, I think that's probably going to arise in particular in cases where we can convince ourselves that the two competing senses of a term seem pretty distinct from each other. I think, I personally think RAS about is one of those cases. 
I think the hard question that Ed is getting at is a question of, are we really finding two distinct senses? Or instead, are we finding um, a more prototypical example of a sense and a less prototypical example of the very same sense? In a case like Rasabout, I think emptying the contents of a container is distinct enough from firing, um, shooting, that I think it's a pretty strong indicator that if all of the examples that you find from the corpus um, involve shooting or firing, that, we, that I would wanna credit that evidence. But I, I think that's some more of the thinking that needs to be done in terms of best practices, in terms of when we can credit corpus analysis are, are gonna require us to be a little more careful about both, are we dealing with two separate senses and what is it about ordinary meaning in terms of the legal theory of ordinary meaning that drives us to, to want to discern it in the first place. There's a lot there and more to say. I hope that's somewhat coherent answer to an excellent question. Thank you. And David Simpson asks the following question. He says, as an appellate practitioner, I'm curious to hear your opinions about what sorts of legal questions you think corpus linguistics can help to answer. To me, at least, clearest use seems to be where the court has to define a multi-word phrase that would not be defined in a traditional dictionary, like discharge a firearm or out of the state. Are there other circumstances where you think it would also be helpful? Now, this is also a great question, David. I, one of the distinctions that I've pointed to in, in some of what I've written is a distinction between what we might think of as lexical ambiguity and what we might think of as structural or syntactic ambiguity. So, so all the problems that I've been talking about today are lexical ambiguity problems. The idea that the word or phrase at issue may have distinct senses or arguably distinct senses if you if you look them up in the dictionary or, or, or try to define the terms um, or the phrases. Uh, another set of problems with respect to, to syntax or structure has to do with you're trying to understand how a certain phrase modifies a different phrase. That was the Facebook versus do good case that I mentioned on the federal slide about United States Supreme Court opinions. And the question there with respect to canons is the canon of the last antecedent versus the canon of the series qualifier. So I, th I think the best example I have for you in terms of other kinds of examples of interpretive problems that, uh, corpus linguistics might help us with is, is that what Justice Alito says in that opinion is if what you're trying to do is figure out whether a modifier attaches to and modifies everything in an antecedent series or just the last antecedent in the series, that's the competition between those, those two canons, maybe getting some evidence from a corpus, from how natural language examples, you know, what, what that might tell us about how, uh, whether and under what circumstances a modifier travels to a whole series versus a last antecedent. There, there are other examples, but that's, that's the main one that comes to mind. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. This one from Fred Voros. If a lawyer retains a linguist to do COCA research and incorporates the linguist's conclusions in a brief, should the lawyer disclose the role of the linguist? Should the rules of expert di disclosures apply? I, I should also figure that my friend Fred Voros, former Judge Voros, would ask one of the one of the really great and, and hard questions here. Fred, that's a, that is a really interesting question. I haven't looked specifically at the rules of expert disclosure and, and technically how they would apply. Um, so I, I would just give you a more kind of gut reaction. It, it, it seems to me that there is a, at least arguably, this is a tentative answer because I, I, would, I would wanna research this before, I would wanna look at the rules before saying anything definitive about this, but it seems to me that th there is at least arguably a difference between what a linguist is doing and what other sorts of experts are doing in a case. Uh, to the extent what the linguist is doing is helping the lawyer discern the meaning of the language of the law, that arguably at least feels a little bit more like legal research than other forms of expert analysis. So, so I, I can just explain, to explain this just a little bit more, 
one of the criticisms in the Rass about majority was um, judges aren't allowed to do um, their own investigation into the facts. That That is uh, the role for advocates and it's the role for witnesses in the case. My response to that is related to my tentative response to this question. And, and it is, there is a distinction between what the law refers to as legislative facts and what it refers to as adjudicative facts. An adjudicative fact is sort of the who, what, when, where, how, what happened in the case and how to analyze or how to interpret the facts of a case. Adjudi uh, legislative facts rather are facts of relevance to the meaning of the law. The, how do you interpret the law? How do you understand it? And I think, again, at least arguably, I, I'm, I'm not sure how this would come out under the uh, disclosure rules with respect to an expert, but at least arguably if what an expert is doing is helping the lawyer with the interpretive task, uh, I'm not sure that it, at least it doesn't feel like the same kind of problem, possibly not meriting the same kind of disclosure. Thank you. I really appreciate that. This was a, a valuable use of our time. Um, by the way, there are a few more comments and questions. And if you have time, Tom, perhaps you could type in your answers to those questions. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we'll now turn to the closing remarks. Professor Bill Eggington has kindly agreed to give the closing remarks at today's event. Bill is an applied sociolinguist with research interests in language planning and policy, intercultural rhetoric, and forensic linguistics. Many years ago, his focus on the sociolinguistics of minority language speakers led to an interest in forensic linguistics. And since then, he's consulted and testified as an expert witness in several dozen criminal and civil cases dealing with a range of issues such as hate crime determination, non-native speakers' comprehension of their legal rights, trademark dilution, contract, language disputes, and authorship attribution. Bill has written or co-edited six books and has produced numerous journal articles and book chapters. He is also a highly sought after expert witness in cases requiring a forensic linguist. And last fall for an entire month, he was featured on Brigham Young University's homepage for the extraordinary work he has done in this area. He retired from BYU about a year ago at the end of a, a long and exceptionally successful career as a professor but he continues to provide expert testimony on a, a wide variety of cases. Importantly, his work often involves the types of corpus linguistic analysis that the speakers have discussed with us today. For me personally, Bill has been a wonderful mentor. Um, he's the reason why I'm wearing a tie today. Um, I hope you enjoy hearing from him as much as I do. Uh, I'll now turn the time over to him to give the final closing remarks after which the Forum on Language and the Law will remain adjourned until next spring. Thank you. Bill, the remainder of the time is yours. So these are the closing remarks and I've only got, um, I guess, 10 minutes or so because you all need to get on with your life. But I've got so much to say that um, I think we'll be finished by six o'clock. Um, one of the first things I want to say is, um, in, in just following this whole, uh, Appreciation of Scott Jarvis for doing what he's done at the University of Utah. Scott is a very modest uh, young man, and um, he, I don't think he's told a lot of people that this year he was given, he and uh, his fellow authors were given the um, um, research article award from the American Association of Applied Linguistics and for doing a paper that was published in the International Journal of Speech, Language and Law on an illusion of understanding how native and non-native speakers of English understand and misunderstand their Miranda rights. Uh, we take the Miranda warnings as something that's uh, comprehensible, but in my experience working on legal cases and, and now Scott's experience, <coughs> um, if you're a non-native English speaker, some of the content, some of the language in the Miranda warnings is basically unfathomable and you have to guess uh, what it's all about. And Scott looked at in his research um, paraphrases of non-native English speakers, what they were looking for, I mean, what they thought they heard and um, looked at them in terms of adequate paraphrases and inadequate paraphrases. Just look at the top one there, if you can see it. Um, you have the right to remain silent, 
was interpreted by some folks as you have to write something because of the homophone right. Um, you have the right to talk to a lawyer and in some variations of the Miranda, that is something like you have the right to have a, an attorney present and that's interpreted as I've got to give a present to an attorney or you can talk to the president, uh, you have to do a presenter. Because by and large, um, right, R-I-G-H-T, as in you have a right and you have the right to have an attorney present, are low frequency words for a lot of these um, folks who are non-native English speakers, low frequency in terms of, of that particular meaning. So um, anyway, one of the things that's come through very quickly, very uh, uh, powerfully, I guess, in today's um, forum is that uh, corpus linguistics is a powerful tool. I just want to give a demonstration of that that I, I uh, give to my students, at least used to give when I taught. Um, and of course, I have to quote, it seems like every forensic linguistics um, or corpus linguistics presentation, the, uh, Jesse Egbert originally, already, already did this, uh, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. So here's a demonstration. X causes Y this verb cause. How do we look at that in terms of corpus data? When we do a corpus analysis, now I'm using coca, and I'm looking at collocates, you know a word by the company it keeps, and I think, okay, what are the words that are, that are associated with X cause Y in terms of probably what happens at the Y? Um, and look at that list there. You can look uh, at uh, if you can see it well, uh, what's common amongst all of those words that follow cause? What sentiment do they express? And if, if we were doing this live, I think I would get out of you that they're all somewhat negative. And so this teaches us something that we didn't know about the meaning of cause in that in the English language, when we use X causes Y, we have a strong tendency to essentially um, uh, ascribe a negative outcome to the cause. And there's all sorts of reasons for that to have occurred that may reflect on the English speaking culture um, that, that, uh, that could be discussed at length. Some of our presenters, the, uh, Tammy and Jesse and, and, um, and um, Judge Lee have mentioned uh, best practices. I'm not going to, I don't have time to talk about it, but um, I thought that if you wanted to know more about best practices in uh, corpus linguistics in its application to the law, if you went to the 2017-2018 BYU Law Review, uh, here we have an excellent resource. And you can see that um, three of our presenters here today uh, have articles, Jesse Egbert, uh, Lauren Solom, and Tammy Gales that are in that uh, as well. So um, this is an excellent resource and uh, will familiarize yourself with, that will enable you to familiarize yourself with um, corpus linguistic applications to the law, as well as um, best practices. And I'm not going to go through those. Um, uh, this is the second um, table of contents there. Um, let me just, um, before I go into the next slide, uh, I'm currently, I, as I was sitting here this morning, I thought, well, how many cases am I currently doing in terms of open, being open cases? Um, I don't want to come across as a hired gun. I really try to, um, as much as I can, to apply scientific principles to my linguistic analysis. Um, and I've done probably over 65 cases now and, um, and testified in court, et cetera, in over 20 of them. Uh, I currently have eight open cases and um, two of them are trademark. One is defamation, one is authorial attribution, uh, author ID. Uh, two cases involve non-native English speakers and their language proficiency. One is a contract interpretation and one is a threat analysis. Um, five of those eight cases, I'm using corpus linguistics. 
and in in there. And so um, the field is uh, the, the the subfield of corpus linguistics. I think is really having an impact as a as a very very important tool. As such, I think we need to um, make sure um, a number of those cases uh, in, in the, within the adversarial system, a number of those cases, uh, I'm doing either rebuttal reports or my initial report has been rebutted uh, by another uh, well-respected, by other well-respected linguists. And I really like this opportunity then to challenge, to be challenged and to challenge um, other linguists' work. And it's, it's, um, it gives me an opportunity to say, okay, let's try to figure out best practices. And it, it was um, best practices, the notion of best practices has been mentioned frequently this morning, just based upon these cases that I've done um, lately it's so important to have the, the, the correct, appropriate corpus. Uh, changing the corpus, not having the right corpus can undermine the reliability and validity of any finding. We need to challenge our assumptions. As linguists, uh, we need to, and now I'm speaking to linguists who may be involved in these cases, uh, we, we, need, we need to look at our ideologies and make sure that our ideologies, our assumptions are not interfering with, uh, with a particular desired so-called outcome. And to that respect, we need to stop or not cherry pick the data. We need to go beyond word frequencies and collocates um, and that the approaches to that have been mentioned this morning. And we need to utilize objective data coding techniques. And by that, I mean, uh, you may remember um, Tammy Gales's presentation where she so, showed some concordance lines and um, uh, came up with um, interpretations of those concordance lines. We have to make sure that um, we use objective interpretations or objective methods of interpreting the court concordance lines. And that quite often can uh, involve using other raters and coming up with rater reliability coefficients. So the last thought I have is why the legal system needs linguists. And, and, and um, Justice Lee commented on this um, and others have as well. And I put in, in red legal system, not just judges, not just lawyers, but the whole system. And I wanna conclude by talking about one particular case that's currently open uh, that I'm still involved in and that for obvious reasons, I cannot mention the details, but this, this has to do with the US uh, Patents and um, Trademark Office, USPTO, a decision they made regarding, and this is to do with an appeal, a decision they made regarding um, whether uh, a uh, application for a trade name uh, was connected with a surname, and in that case um, was denied. This, this caused me in my research on this to go into um, some of the decisions made by the USPTO. Now, I'm not criticizing the USPTO and examining attorneys from there. All I'm saying here is that they need ling linguists to inform them. And I found that quite often their decision on um, whether something was a surname or not was decided upon them had deciding that this particular name had the look and feel of a surname. To that res in that respect, it was somewhat arbitrary. And when something in the legal system, especially these days, comes across as being an arbitrary decision, you can bet that someone somewhere will ascribe some negative, and in this case, racist motivation. And so I came across this article. Now, I don't, I'm not saying the folks at the USPTO are racist, but they've an unintended consequence of, um, of arbitrary decisions, or at least decisions that appear to be arbitrary, not based, at, that involve linguistics, that are not based upon linguistic science, opens the door 
for these kinds of accusations. And so uh, this particular article basically says, you know what, um, if you can read the top paragraph there, in other words, businesses capture non-white surnames more than white surnames as property and can prevent people with those. Essentially, what I found in this particular uh, study was that the, the, uh, the perceived arbitrary nature of these decisions uh, were being ascribed as coming from some kind of racist perspective. That's one reason why we need linguists in the, within the system. And so I think uh, uh, Justice Lee's comment that uh, there needs to be more and more linguistic training given to uh, people in law schools. There needs to be more uh, of this kind of thing that's happening here with this, um, um, with this forum more awareness that linguists can help apply scientific methods to legal decisions that, that lessen the notion perhaps of arbitrariness. And that I think is very important. I'm very, very pleased um, with uh, what I've learned this morning with this and from my colleagues. And uh, I hope we can continue to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you.